Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome everyone to the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today as usual. And Jim, we started the week uh, looking at numbers from Quinnipiac and why not continue there on Thursday? Because after looking at several Senate races, they're now taking a look at the presidential race. And they're especially giving us good numbers on Hillary Clinton. Good from our perspective anyway. Hillary's uh, favorables have gone in the tank since February. I can't imagine why. Uh, she, her, her favorables are underwater now in Iowa, and by 10 points in Colorado, she's still barely above water in Virginia. But the interesting thing here, uh, Jim, is that the Republican presidential candidates, many of them, are now either slightly ahead of her or basically dead even with her statistically in the three key states that they're looking at here, Colorado, Iowa, and Virginia. Rand Paul, who had his rollout, is now ahead by three points in Colorado, 44-41. He's up by one in Iowa, down four in Virginia. Uh, Scott Walker is, is drawing even or doing better than her in, in every state except Virginia. Even Mike Huckabee's drawing close. Looks like Jeb Bush is the only one who hasn't quite caught up to her yet, and maybe Chris Christie. Um, so Hillary is taking a hit here. The question is, will the hits keep coming? Yeah, uh, a couple of things stand out about those numbers. One being... Um, that you know, we should acknowledge the slightly bad news. Virginia, she's still pretty solid. Obviously, look, all, all standard caveat, caveats apply. This is very early. Um, she is, you know, obviously not, you know, drastically losing any of these uh, states we kind of consider to be purple or, or really important for Republicans here. But obviously, she has slid a lot. And really, for a good stretch of the past two years, the head-to-head polling would put Hillary in the, you know, high 40s, low 50s. Um, sometimes even a little higher than that. And the Republicans, who at this point don't have really terrific national name ID, uh, other than maybe Jeb Bush, you know, somewhere in the you know high 30s, mid to low 40s. And that would put, you know, put a very solid lead for Hillary Clinton in these places. And, you know, Republicans might look at them and feel a little bit of nervousness. The media and Hillary friends might be saying, woohoo, she's going to, you know, she's, she's way ahead. We're set for a landslide. Yeah. It, what it, all it reflected was name ID and the fact that it was early. People weren't thinking of her um, all that seriously. And to the extent she had much of a reputation, it was that as the relatively nonpartisan top diplomat going around the country. Well, things have changed. <laughs> she has now taken, you know, had a, a couple brutal um, uh, news cycles regarding this issue of her emails. The fact that ultimately they were not secure and, you know, more and more experts like the former head of the, Defense Intelligence Agency saying, I'm sure, of course, it would have been a serious target of friends and foes alike trying to intercept her messages and things like that, saying there's probably a very good chance that this has been hacked by foreign intelligence. She had a terrible press conference. And while the issues kind of died down for a couple of days, um, the, the it, it did damage. You know, that she has very bad numbers in terms of honesty and trustworthiness. And the likes of Paul Begala during that whole story were saying, no, 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 voters don't care. This is a nothing burger, a nothing sandwich with a side of nothing fries and a nothing shake and, you know, insisting it was nothing. Now we look at these numbers and no, it was not nothing. People look at this and didn't like what they saw. Now, if you're a Republican, these are not fantastic numbers. You'd like to be ahead of Hillary Clinton. Um, But I think it indicates that, look, she is not some colossus on the political scene. She is not unbeatable. She is not. In fact, she's a very flawed candidate who, as the election gets closer, is probably going to look more and more brittle um, and out of touch and and just, you know, just flat out not as uh, not a strong favorite as uh, as election, this election gets closer. All right. On to the bad martini now. Actually, there's no bad martini today. The other good martini comes to us courtesy of uh, Rand Paul. In addition to announcing his candidacy on Tuesday, Rand Paul has gotten a lot of attention the past couple of days for contentious interviews, including one with Savannah Guthrie about uh, his previous and current positions on a number of foreign policy issues. But then he was talking with uh, the Associated Press up in New Hampshire about the issue of abortion. And the question was, you know, what restrictions are you in favor of? What restrictions are you not in favor of when it comes to abortion? And Paul kind of gave a long uh, general answer to the question, didn't necessarily directly address it. He was referring here, Jim, to his time as uh, a physician. He's an ophthalmologist, obviously, and dealing with very small children who are born prematurely. Some of them are small enough that I can put them in the palm of my hand, sometimes a pound, sometimes uh, under a pound. 
and nobody really sort of questions whether they have rights. They're there, and if you do something to the baby or try to harm a baby in the neonatal nursery, that's murder, because everybody is in agreement that baby's alive. Um, but the way our society is now and the way our rules are written, if you're a five or a six pound baby in the womb, you don't have any legal rights. In general, I'm pro-life. So I will support legislation that advances and shows that life is special and deserves protection. And then later he specifically said, why don't you go ask the Democrats who don't want any restrictions why it's OK to abort a seven pound baby right before it's born. So, uh, Jim, uh, interesting debate. Uh, Paul is definitely has a confrontational style, but he's, he's doing a good job of turning around a question that is almost entirely and always aimed at Republicans. Yeah, and I think you know, we, we have debated whether we should put this in as the good martini. I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt. Um, I look at that answer, particularly the, hey, <laughs> why don't you ask Democrats about their views on, on late-term abortion? And pointing out the fairly odd, the polling of this number, most Americans are somewhere in that mushy middle. Uh, they may not be on board with a full across-the-board complete ban, um, but a lot of them are very uncomfortable with partial birth abortion and lots of late-term abortion and abortion after 20 weeks and uh, are okay with legal restrictions against it. Uh, they kind of believe that, you know, what, uh, first of all, one poll recently put out said that 52% of Americans believe that life begins at conception. And even if you're not convinced of that, if you are, you know, the idea that, you know, <laughs> life only begins when you're entirely out of the womb, and thus, per, you know, partial birth abortion is hunky-dory, uh, a lot of Americans have objections to that. So on the one hand, you know, this is like that X-Files poster, I want to believe. I, I want to believe that this was a good answer and that, that Rand Paul is going to benefit from this for what it's worth. He challenged, he said, why don't you ask Debbie Wasserman Schultz, you know, whether she's okay with this. And she said she believes there should be no restrictions on abortion whatsoever. I think there are a lot of people who would find that position abominable. There are a lot of people who would say that is effectively legalized murder of children in this country. And it is their preeminent goal in life to end this regime this status quo in which basically, you know, we all know the numbers of un untold, you know, un unbelievable numbers of children don't get born uh, because of these laws. I think one of the great ironies is, look, what, what is the one word that all, most often comes to mind when people hear Rand Paul, Greg? Libertarian? Yeah. And so here he is in a situation in which he actually wants to have the government, you know, he wants to, to expand the role of government in a way to basically say, look, here is something you are currently allowed to do that I don't want you to be allowed to do anymore. And it's probably one of the few issues in which he is not um, classically libertarian. Uh, I realize that there are pro-life libertarians, there are pro-choice libertarians, there's a great deal of divide there. I hope this works out for him. I want this to work out for him. I am much closer to his leanings on this issue than to Debbie Wasserman Schultz's. I am not sure that this is a um, easy issue to win on for the Republicans. I think this is very easy to demagogue. And uh, we'll see how it shakes out. I, I want to see this uh, this win. And, uh, you know, if nothing else, it is really thrilling to see a Republican finally turn the question on the media and say, hey, you have an enormous double standard to have the way you talk about this issue. Why don't you ever point out when the other side is in uh, opposition to public opinion? All right. On to the crazy martini now. And, Jim, it was just a couple of weeks ago we were talking about safe places at places like Brown University and some other uh, northeastern colleges where you have to go to rest on pillows and watch videos of puppies and play with bubbles and Play-Doh if you ever hear an opinion that's contrary to one that you're pretty passionate about. Well, uh, the <laughs> nanny state on campus uh, recently had another flare-up. This one at the University of Michigan, which is, of course, the Harvard of the Big Ten and better than every other school academically. And if it weren't for Hillsdale, it would be the best in the state. But uh, when it comes to their PC status, unfortunately, it's, it's getting worse and worse. There was a, a group who uh, put out a letter that convinced the campus to cancel a showing of American Sniper. And uh, here was one of the paragraphs in the letter. The movie American Sniper not only tolerates but promotes anti-Muslim and anti-Mina. And if you don't know what anti-Mina is, it's Muslim, Middle Eastern, and North African rhetoric and sympathizes with a mass killer. Chris Kyle was a racist who took a disturbing stance on murdering Iraqi civilians. Watching this movie is provocative and unsafe to Mina and Muslim students who are too often reminded of how little the media and world value their lives. So the school scrapped the showing of American Sniper and I kid you not, replaced it with Paddington Bear. And that then led to another blowback from some students who said, why shouldn't we have the opportunity to watch American Sniper? This 
should be a uh, place where people of different opinions get different opportunities. And enter the hero in this story, brand new Michigan football coach Jim Harbaugh. In his tweet, Michigan football will watch American Sniper. Proud of Chris Kyle and proud to be an American. And if that offends anybody, so be it. So American Sniper is now back on at Michigan. There is an alternate showing still of Paddington. But kudos to Jim Harbaugh. His first win, although it probably won't end up in the, in the scorebook. <laughs> and by the way, if you can't beat the campus winders, who can you beat? Um, but, you know, so there's a, a not so funny aspect of this story, which is to say when, you know, and, and you're seeing more and more of this on conservative blogs, our college days are, are some ways behind us, Greg. But when you were at, when you were at college, do you remember administrators knuckling under and folding whenever anybody objected to anything anywhere? <laughs> Hillsdale, not a chance. Okay, there <laughs> Is it even you know even at uh, GW places like that, they hiked tuition. We complained. Hey, you know, go, go to heck, students. We don't care what you think. We're going to do what we want to do. Shut up. Pay your tuition. Go away. You know, um, it was a different time, Greg. Uh, <laughs> you know, so now, oh, American Sniper is going to traumatize us. Eh. Like the idea, if you don't like American Sniper, don't go watch it. Right? The idea, no, you can't show this here. We are very impressed by the fact that somebody somewhere is going to watch this movie. In fact, if somebody gets a DVD player or, or gets it on demand and watches it, uh, stop them. No, we we have to avert our eyes. We're going to be impressed if somebody so ban students who've watched it in the theater. We can't, you know, <laughs> don't let it pollute our minds. You know, um, this this hysterics, this this kind of you know inane sense of please, you know, don't expose us to any idea we might disagree with. Uh, besides the fact that, you know, it's a great movie, it was nominated for Best Picture and uh, Best Actor and, you know, highest grossing and most popular movie of last year, Greg. Uh, but it's, it's inappropriate for the University of Michigan campus. I'm glad they backed down. Uh, serious kudos to Coach Harbaugh. Now, a lot of people are chuckling about the decision to replace it with Paddington, <laughs> um, Greg, but I, I think there is a there's a natural compromise here. Um, and I am really looking forward to Paddington 2. Bear sniper, uh, it, you know, because you've seen the technology with Ted by Seth MacFarlane. You know, they can make a little cute animated bear. And so, what if you know uh, a cute animated bear joined the SEALs and joined you know the American military and went to you know to serve his country, or maybe even the UK Special Forces? Since Paddington is British, I, I would watch that movie. So you send him into Afghanistan, or, or you know maybe we do it in Yemen. It could be fiction. It could be ripped from current events. I'm willing to watch Paddington versus ISIS. You know <laughs> this bear is ready for the hunt. He is going to show his claws, and you could just see you know the Al Baghdadi types walking in. Oh, what a good bear! This is for you know. <laughs> I've had enough of you, Al Baghdadi. Obviously, you know we'll have somebody like Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, you know doing. <laughs> Dubbing up there. Or, you know, Jason Statham. He's doing all the action movies these days. Let him do the voice of Paddington in this. <laughs> and let him, you know, just blowing away jihadists left and right and stuff. You Tell, tell me you would not go and see that movie, Greg. Oh, I'd be there on opening night. Are you kidding? There you go. So, uh, Seth MacFarlane, call my office and uh, we'll talk. And we'll find you right away. We can either make it Ted 3, but I really think it works better if it's Paddington. You know, <laughs> that, that he watches sometime in which Britain has been a victim of terrorism. Uh, and he decides to take out appropriate, you know, rough justice against the perpetrators. That That's a $300 million movie right there, Greg. Oh, man. Get the copyright, the trademark on that now. You'll be a rich man. Jim, you're off to the NRA convention. We'll see you on Tuesday. All right. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And tune in again on Friday for the next Three Martini Lunch.